Hi everyone. So let us begin today's class. So in this class, uh, I have prepared few slides where I have uh, mentioned all the important keywords and uh, very very high yield tables. Okay. So all these were being asked in the past few years, both in INICT as well as in the NEET PG. So let us try to master these topics, and they are going to help you a lot. So first of all, uh, we would be beginning with the cannula sizes this is very very important okay so if you look at the uh, previous ini cities also you will appreciate that they have asked about cannula sizes now cannula sizes you also have to know what gauge of cannula is it the color as well as the flow rate okay so all these things are very very important so number one we have 14 gauge this is orange colored okay and the flow rate is 270 milliliter per minute. So regarding the flow rate, I'll tell you a trick, but first of all, no 14 gauge, which is orange, 16 gauge is gray. So you draw 16 like this. In a similar way, you draw G like this, right? So the color is going to be gray. The color is going to be gray. So 16 gauge is gray, 17 is white white all right 18 is green 18 is green and 20 is pink 22 is blue 24 yellow 26 violet this is very very important learn this okay now let us uh, try to remember the trick how to remember the flow rate okay so how to remember the flow rate starting from 26 Okay, the flow rate is 10, milli, uh, 10 milliliter per minute. From 26 gauge, you start, this is 10 milliliter per minute. You add one more 10, this becomes 20. 20 milliliter per minute, this is for 24. Now, what happens is 20 plus 10, this will become 30. So this is the flow rate for, as you can see in this picture, for a 22 gauge. Okay, now 20 plus 30 equals to 50. So this is the flow rate for 20 gauge. Then the 50 plus 30 is equal to 80. This is the flow rate for 18 gauge. Now 80 plus 50, that is 130. That is the flow rate for 17 gauge. Okay, and then 130 plus 80, that is 210. And ultimately last you can learn that is 270 milliliter per minute. That is for the 14 gauge. And one more thing, gauge is inversely proportional to the size of the cannula. All right, the smaller the gauge, the largest. So 14 is the largest. Let us move on to the next topic. So this is a very, very high yield topic, the IHC markers. For any exam, the IHC markers are very high yield. So let us uh, try to know these. So IHC markers, what is the significance? Why do you want to know about the IHC markers? IHC is immunohistochemical markers, okay? The reason is that if you know the IHC markers, they are going to give you an idea about the origin of the tumor cells. Okay, where is the origin of the tumor cells taking place? So number one, number one, chromogranin and synaptophysin. So you might have heard about it. Chromogranin, synaptophysin, neuron specific enolase. Okay, so what are these markers for? Yes, these markers are for the neuroendocrinal tumors okay neuroendocrinal tumors and the examples of neuroendocrinal tumors are small cell carcinoma of the lung pheochromocytoma carcinoid tumor neuroblastoma okay now let us do a little bit integration here yes as i said that uh, the examples of uh, neuroendocrinal tumors neuroendocrinal tumors they are number one small cell carcinoma of the lung small cell carcinoma of the lung yesterday i told you a few things about small cell carcinoma of the lung okay what are those number one this is the cancer with maximum paraneoplastic syndromes second salt and pepper chromatin salt and pepper chromatin Third central location, third central location, fourth very strong association with smoking, 
strongly associated with smoking all right moving on to the next parent uh, sorry the next neuroendocrine tumor the example is pheochromocytoma pheochromocytoma now let us also discuss few keywords about pheochromocytoma because this is a very important tumor okay so supposing this is the kidney who is sitting above the kidney i told you in the previous lectures this is what adrenal gland adrenal gland and adrenal gland is further being divided into adrenal cortex and adrenal medulla okay so pheochromocytoma is what pheochromocytoma is the tumor of tumor of adrenal medulla excellent so okay van well, gurji you gave the right answer so pheochromocytoma is the tumor of adrenal medulla second question again i am repeating this point we did this in the previous class also who stimulates the adrenal medulla to produce the catecholamines who stimulates the adrenal medulla to produce the catecholamines your answer is acetylcholine your answer is acetylcholine okay remember this point second which cells in the adrenal medulla produce the catecholamines your answer is chromaffin cells chromaffin cells so there are chromaffin cells in the adrenal medulla which when stimulated upon by the acetylcholine they release the catecholamines since pheochromocytoma is the tumor of adrenal medulla right what will happen what happens whenever there is release of uh, catecholamines for example under the fight and flight response okay the, the the normal catecholamine release won't be there there would be huge quantities of catecholamines that would be released in the circulation so very high levels very high levels of catecholamines whenever there is any kind of stress to the body whenever there is any kind of stress to the body okay that means supposing the stress could be the physical stress the emotional stress okay the patient that are going surgery or trauma so this these are all the forms of stress to the body so whenever there is any kind of stress to the body there is release of catecholamines but in case of pheochromocytoma the catecholamines that are being released they are being released in very huge amounts because this is already a tumor of adrenal medulla okay due to this release of huge release of catecholamines whenever there is stress to the body what is going to happen there is going to be episodic hypertension so this is very important keyword guys so whenever you read any question and they they are mentioning about episodic hypertension that means that uh, this uh, hypertension this uh, increase in the blood pressure is occurring in episodes whenever there is huge release of the catecholamines then there is hypertension this is episodic hypertension this is a hallmark of pheochromocytoma all right keep this point in mind another point about pheochromocytoma so i'll give you a clinical scenario here a patient diagnosed with medullary carcinoma of thyroid so supposing a patient comes to your office and this patient is being diagnosed with the medullary carcinoma of the thyroid okay now you plan the surgery you are the surgeon you plan the surgery to remove this okay and you did the surgery while doing the surgery patient became hemodynamically unstable while doing the surgery the patient became hemodynamically unstable and the patient died what is the situation that we are talking about can anyone talk about it what is the situation that we are dealing with now the patient was having medullary carcinoma of the thyroid the surgeon operated and the patient died or became hemodynamically unstable so this is a scenario when you do not when you do not rule out 
pheochromocytoma. When you do not rule out pheochromocytoma. So this is a very important point guys. Okay, whenever a patient of medullary carcinoma of thyroid comes to you, always rule out pheochromocytoma. What is the reason? Exactly. So Manasi, this is, uh, yes, you gave the right answer. Because what happens is, ke whenever a patient of medullary carcinoma thyroid comes to you, you always have to rule pheochromocytoma. The reason is that if you do not rule out pheochromocytoma in a medullary carcinoma the thyroid patient, you may miss a very important thing. Okay, this patient could be having men's syndrome. This patient could be having men's syndrome. So this is your homework to read about the different types of men's syndrome. Men 1, men 2A, 2B. Okay, all the conditions associated with the different type of men's syndrome, they are very, very high yield. So remember, which type of men's syndrome consists of this? Medullary carcinoma, the thyroid and the pheochromocytoma. We are talking about men too. We are talking about men too. Okay. So if you have not ruled out the pheochromocytoma in a patient who is having medullary carcinoma, the thyroid, and you have taken the patient for surgery. If you have taken the patient for the surgery, what happens? Surgery is a kind of physical stress to the body. So this is surgery is a kind of stress to the body. And as you know, what happens during stress, the catecholamines would be released. But here in this situation, the catecholamines won't be released in the normal amounts. They would, there will be huge surge in the catecholamines or huge release of catecholamines. Due to this, obviously there will be huge rise in the blood pressure and the patient may become hemodynamically unstable. Hemodynamically unstable. So guys, the take home message here is that okay, whenever you come across a patient who is diagnosed with medullary carcinoma of the thyroid, always rule out pheochromocytoma. Before ruling out, without ruling out pheochromocytoma, please do not do the surgery. Okay, the reason is clear in front of you. So keep this point in mind. So coming back from where we started, the other examples of uh, the neuroendocrinal tumor, another example is neuroblastoma. Neuroblastoma. So can anyone... Uh, Tell me the differential diagnosis of neuroblastoma. The differential diagnosis of neuroblastoma. Yes, neuroblastoma is a kind of neuroendocrinal tumor. The differential diagnosis of neuroblastoma. What is it? Anyone? Exactly. So, Gurjeet and Patel, you gave the right answer. The answer to this question is nephroblastoma. Nephroblastoma is also known as Wilms tumor. Wilms tumor. Okay, so Wilms tumor is also a very, very important topic. Now, what happens is you compare neuroblastoma with Wilms tumor. What is the reason? Why do you compare them? Why do you compare them? The reason is that both of them may present with the abdominal mass. Okay, both of them may present with abdominal mass. In a child. Abdominal mass in a child. But how do you differentiate? How do you differentiate neuroblastoma from nephroblastoma? So what you want to do is. Make this table. Neuroblastoma occurs usually most commonly. In children less than 2 years of age. Willing's tumor and nephroblastoma occurs in children. Around 2 to 5 years of age. Around 2 to 5 years of age. Secondly. The abdominal mass that we are talking about in neuroblastoma as well as the nephroblastoma. What is the difference? Remember, in Wilms tumor, the abdominal mass that is present, this does not cross the midline. This does not cross the midline. Okay, so it is not going to cross the midline. Neuroblastoma, the abdominal mass crosses the midline crosses the midline. Second point about it, the abdominal mass that that is uh, seen in case of the Wilms tumor or the nephroblastoma. So if you palpate that, okay, when you examine the child, this is going to be a very smooth mass. This is going to be a very smooth mass, okay. Whereas the edges are also very smooth. Whereas in case of the neuroblastoma, this is going to be kind of irregular. 
irregular mass okay so more smooth mass palpated does not cross the midline that is Wilms tumor irregular mass that is neuroblastoma crossing the midline so remember these two important points coming back to the IHC markers second we have a cytokeratin 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 what is the target so if you talk about the cytokeratin as an IHC marker the, it would tell you the tumors are rising from the epithelial cells epithelial cells and what are those cancers it could be squamous cell carcinoma either of the skin or the lung or basal cell carcinoma okay squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma keep this point in mind okay uh, one question here i told you guys to read about paraneoplastic syndromes because they are very high yield so let me ask you one question here increase in serum dash is seen as a paraneoplastic syndrome associated with squamous cell carcinoma of the lung squamous cell carcinoma of the lung what is the answer anyone Increased serum dash is seen as the is seen as a consequence of paraneoplastic syndrome associated with this squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. Anyone? Hmm? Your answer here is calcium. Okay, so hypercalcemia, hypercalcemia of malignancy. hypercalcemia malignancy this is this happens okay this uh, due to the squamous cell carcinoma of the lung one of the paraneoplastic syndrome associated with it so know this point moving on to the next point then we have desmin 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 is having m in it so this tells you that the tumor cells are rising from the muscle okay so tumors of the muscle will show the desmin positivity okay so which are those muscles rhabdomyosarcoma leomyosarcoma these are the tumors of the muscles in which desmin would be positive. Then talking about the GFAP. GFAP is glial fibrillary acidic protein. And this tells you that the tumor cells are having neuroglial origin. Okay. So what are those tumors? Astrocytoma and glioblastoma. So what is that peculiarity of glioblastoma? Yes, you might have read about glioblastoma also. Glioblastoma. It is also known as the butterfly glioma. It is also known as the butterfly glioma. This is a high grade. This is a high grade astrocytoma and this occurs in elderly. This occurs in elderly when you do the neuroimaging. This is having a necrotic center. This is having a necrotic center. Okay, this is known as a butterfly glioma because this is crossing the midline. So this is giving such an appearance on neuroimaging. Okay, these are the important points regarding glioblastoma. Coming back. Moving on to the next marker, PSA. PSA stands for prostate specific antigen. Okay, now remember guys, PSA is not a very specific uh, IHC marker because PSA could be positive in case of the prostatitis or BPH also. Okay, but still, when you talk about the IHC marker for a cancer, right? So PSA indicates that the cancer is arising from the prostatic epithelium, and obviously this is prostate cancer. This is going to be the prostate cancer. Moving on to the S hundred. S hundred. S hundred indicates that the tumor cells are having neural crest origin. Okay, the examples are melanoma, schwannoma, melanoma, schwannoma. So regarding melanoma, guys, please read at home about melanoma, the ABCD, okay, the asymmetry, the color changes and all that. And what is the prognostic uh, indicator of melanoma? Can anyone answer this question? What is the prognostic indicator of melanoma? The depth or the horizontal growth? The vertical growth or the horizontal growth? What will be your answer? Exactly, Gurjeet. You give the right answer. The vertical growth or the depth. The vertical growth or the depth is telling you about the prognosis. The more the vertical growth or the depth, more the poor will be the prognosis. All right. So, 
this was about the uh, one more uh, IEC market is left, I guess. Yeah. So trap. Trap stands for tartar rate assistant acid phosphatase. Okay. So this is a tum uh, This is a, a kind of IHC marker that is present in case of hairy cell leukemia. So trap positive. So supposing you come across any question in which they write trap positive, you can answer hairy cell leukemia. Okay. Then vimentin. Vimentin is a marker that tells you that the tumor is having mesenchymal origin all right for example sarcomas then apart from the sarcomas endometrial carcinoma rcc meningioma mesothelioma also now one thing is that we have missed is langerhans cell histiocytosis so s100 is also a marker for langerhans cell histiocytosis so when you talk about langerhans cell histiocytosis a lot of times uh, few points about langerhans cell histiocytosis have been asked in different exams histiocytosis okay number one the markers what are the markers cd1a and s100 so supposing the question mentions this is a cd1a and s100 positive tumor secondly supposing they give you electron microscopy picture this is very high yield point if they give you electron microscopy picture Yes. Anyone? Electron microscopy picture. What is the appearance that you see? You see Burbeck granules. You see Burbeck granules. Okay. And what is the appearance known as? Tennis racket. Okay. So they are tennis racket shaped. Tennis racket shaped. A quick question guys, what are Langerhans cells? I told you in the previous lectures, what are Langerhans cells? Can anyone comment on this? What, what are Langerhans cells? Yes? Langerhans cells are the antigen presenting cells present in the skin. Langerhans cells are the modified dendritic cells either you can write them as modified dendritic cells or you may also call them the antigen presenting cells in the skin and i made you write the different names of antigen presenting cells in the previous lecture so examples are b lymphocytes macrophages monocytes okay then the langerhans cells and the dendritic cells these are all the examples of antigen presenting cells all right now moving on to the next high yield topic samuma bodies okay so supposing in the question you get a picture like this so look at this uh, histopathological picture very carefully so these are samuma bodies how they can describe the samuma bodies how they can describe it samuma bodies are concentric laminated spherules as you can see these are concentric laminated spherules okay which are having calcifications now i question is okay, which type of calcification your answer is dystrophic calcification dystrophic calcification okay this is a list of the conditions in which you see the samuma bodies so this list is very very important so you can make a flashcard about it number one papillary carcinoma of the thyroid so write down one very very important point regarding papillary carcinoma of the thyroid which was being asked in the previous years okay the type of thyroid cancer type of thyroid cancer associated with childhood irradiation okay so supposing a child who got head and neck cancer was given radiotherapy okay and ultimately later in life the, the child may develop the thyroid cancer so which type of thyroid cancer papillary carcinoma of the thyroid Okay, so if in the question it is mentioned that the child was being given radiotherapy to the head and neck because he was having some cancer and ultimately developed a thyroid cancer, your answer is going to be papillary carcinoma of the thyroid. Okay, then somatostatinoma. In somatostatinoma also, you see the samoma bodies, then meningioma, malignant mesothelioma, ovarian serous carcinoma, then prolactinoma, and serous endometrial carcinoma. Okay, so keep these points in mind. These are very, very important. One uh, more point here. 
let me add one more slide here so i'll ask you a question so supposing you are given a, a scenario in which patient used to work uh, on the ships he used to do the repairing in the ships okay now this patient who used to do the repairing in the ships now is coming and uh, ultimately he is having lung cancer or not the lung cancer he is having some kind of cancer okay so what is this uh, occupation related to first of all what is this hint although this is not the proper st but i just wanted to focus on this exactly manshi you gave the right answer we are talking about here the asbestos exposure asbestos exposure so this is a very important point okay asbestos exposure now asbestos exposure had been associated with the cancer okay what is the most common cancer associated with the asbestos exposure exactly the answer is bronchogenic carcinoma bronchogenic carcinoma okay so keep this point in mind and the other cancer associated is mesothelioma but but in uh, one of the exam it was being asked okay, which one is most common so your answer is going to be bronchogenic okay so your answer is going to be bronchogenic carcinoma this is the most common associated with the asbestos exposure and then one more point here if they have to give about asbestos no okay are you guys able to see my screen is my screen visible is my screen visible okay 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 well please check your internet connection because uh, others are able to view it okay so one very important point regarding asbestos in the question they may mention about pleural plaques they may mention about pleural plaques and asbestos bodies okay so pleural plaques important hint coming back now moving on to the next very very high yield topic so when you look at the previous year questions of different exams be it, be it ini ct or neat okay this topic is very very important translocations so if you learn this you are going to score okay this is very scoring so number 1 is t922 you might be knowing about it so see 90% of the students they know about cml but if cml is not given in the option what will you mark all so this is very important point if cml is not given in the options you will mark all all right then t814 this is for burkitt lymphoma burkitt lymphoma can anyone tell me the presentation of a patient having burkitt lymphoma presentation of a patient having burkitt lymphoma remember you could be given an african american child or first of all you should know this presentation could be of a child having a jaw mass okay jaw mass remember this point and what is that appearance starry sky appearance these are the keywords for burkitt lymphoma so t814 translocation so a child having jaw mass and starry sky appearance on histopath okay this is burkitt lymphoma now t1418 this is follicular lymphoma okay follicular lymphoma what is the history of a patient having follicular lymphoma what kind of history could be given to you waxing and waning waxing and waning lymphadenopathy waxing and waning lymphadenopathy that means 
the lymph nodes could be enlarged at one time and then they will be normal then again enlarged okay so waxing and waning lymphadenopathy this is the keyword for follicular lymphoma another keyword is t1418 then talking about the t1114 that is for the mental cell lymphoma mental cell lymphoma learn these t1118 this is for the marginal zone b cell lymphoma marginal zone b cell lymphoma all right then 1517 this is for the aml m3 so this is very very high yield so market task location 1517 okay this is associated with the acute promyelocytic leukemia acute promyelocytic leukemia which is aml m3 okay which is aml m3 this is very very important because this has been asked several times so market then talking about the t1122 t1122 this is also very important because this is seen this is associated with ewing sarcoma ewing sarcoma what is ewing sarcoma what is ewing sarcoma anyone ewing sarcoma is a bone tumor bone tumor okay in a boy the kind of history i am telling you okay so young boy presenting with the mass okay in the leg or the thigh so this is a bone tumor common in males then this is the example this is this could be a neuroendocrinal tumor then we have one more bone tumor which is very important so let us integrate that that is osteosarcoma osteosarcoma what's important about osteosarcoma is it, is its associations association of osteosarcoma so you can mark three arrows under it the conditions associated with osteosarcoma number one is paget's disease of bone okay the paget's disease of the bone number one association of osteosarcoma because if they ask you okay what type of cancer the patient of paget disease could develop your answer is osteosarcoma okay second retinoblastoma second is retinoblastoma okay third what is the third association lee from any syndrome okay lee from any syndrome so what happens there is p53 mutations are there so the patient develops multiple cancers at a young age so these are the three associations of osteosarcoma that you have to keep in mind moving on to the next point this is also very very important so there are different organisms or the pathogens that could be included in the etiopathogenesis of few cancers okay so now ebv is the most important of all them so ebv what type of cancers ebv could cause number one is burkitt lymphoma i already told you the keywords for burkitt lymphoma what are the keywords a child presenting with jaundice okay then you learn the translocation then hodgkin lymphoma so let us write down very very high yield uh, keyword here can anyone tell me the pathognomic feature of hodgkin lymphoma the pathognomic feature of uh, hodgkin lymphoma yes yeah exactly gurjeet you give the right answer the pathognomic feature of hodgkin lymphoma is reed sternberg cells reed sternberg cells okay if reed sternberg cells are not there then it is non hodgkin lymphoma and second thing reed sternberg cells are cd15 and cd30 positive okay reed sternberg cells are cd15 and cd30 positive moving on to the next one nasopharyngeal carcinoma 
So nasopharyngeal carcinoma is also associated with the EBV, that is Epstein-Barr virus. Then primary CNS lymphoma. Now, can anyone tell me about uh, primary CNS lymphoma? Yes, primary CNS lymphoma. Guys, primary CNS lymphoma is one of the condition that could happen more commonly in HIV positive individuals. HIV positive individuals. And how would it appear on neuroimaging? Solitary ring enhancing lesion. It will appear as a solitary ring enhancing lesion on neuroimaging. So supposing you are being given a question in which they tell you the patient is HIV positive, the CD4 count is less than 100 and ultimately on the neuroimaging you are finding a solitary ring enhancing lesion. This could be due to primary CNS lymphoma caused by EBV. Okay. But let us write down one, one very important point here. Similarly, if I tell you HIV positive individual, CD4 count, CD4 count less than 100. On neuroimaging, you find multiple ring enhancing lesions. Multiple ring enhancing lesions. What you can expect here? Yes, this is a typical history in case of cerebral. Toxoplasmosis is excellent. Cerebral toxoplasmosis. Okay. So this is being caused by toxoplasma gondii. So this is a very important point. Guys, what is the normal CD4 count? What is the normal CD4 count? Anyone? You should see this is not for road learning, but this is for your understanding. If they mention the CD4 count in the question, you should at least know is it normal or not. Or the, if the patient has landed up having AIDS, AIDS means CD4 count should be less than 200. Or there could there should be AIDS defining lesions. Yes, Mansi gave the right answer. The answer is 500 to 1500. Okay, 500 to 1500 is the normal CD4 count. Keep this point in mind and the CD4 count at which you will call the person to have patient to have AIDS is less than 200 okay less than 200 write down a few important points here if someone is getting infected due to cat feces the organism could be if the question is mentioning cat feces contamination It could be toxoplasma gondii. Okay, the organism could be toxoplasma gondii. But if the question mentions cat scratch, someone got the cat scratch, which organism associated with the cat scratch? Yes, your answer is going to be hmm? excellent, Bartonella Hensley. Bartonella Hensley. Someone is asking for the last slide. Don't worry, after this lecture, I will be uploading all these PDFs on my Telegram group. Okay. The Telegram group is by the same name, Dr. Simran Kaur. Okay. Now, cat bite. If the question mentions cat bite or dog bite, Yes. Your answer is going to be you can think about pasturella multocita. Pasturella multocita. Okay. Yes, dog bite associated with the rabies also. Alright, so when you talk about the cat bite, that is pasturella multocita, cat feces, toxoplasma, cat scratch, butterella insulin. Okay, so these are important points here. Coming back. Hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus. 
they could be leading to which type of cancer? Can anyone tell? Hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus could lead to which type of cancer? Your answer is hepatocellular carcinoma. Yes, good. Will you give the right answer? Human mite is associated with the E. canella. E. canella. Okay. Yes, hepatocellular carcinoma associated with the hep B and the hep C. Okay. Now, important point here. Among hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus, against which virus do we have a vaccine? Yes. Against which virus do we have vaccine? Hepatitis B or C? Anyone? We have vaccine for hepatitis B. Vaccine for hepatitis B. Okay. Jitu, in the next class, I'll explain the serology of hepatitis, which is very, very high yield. Okay. So, attend the next class also. So, hepatocellular carcinoma associated with the hep B and hep C exposure. Among these, we have vaccine for hepatitis B. All right. Then talking about the HHV8. HHV8, that is human herpes virus 8, that is associated with Kaposi sarcoma. Okay. Now, what type of cancer is Kaposi sarcoma? Can anyone tell what type of cancer is Kaposi sarcoma? Yes, Kaposi sarcoma is what? This is a cancer arising from the endothelium. Okay, this is a vascular malignancy. Or this is arising from the endothelial cells or endothelium. That is the inner lining of a blood vessel. Okay, so remember, Kaposi sarcoma is not just limited to skin. The viscera could also be involved. The organs could also be involved. Because Kaposi sarcoma is arising from the endothelium. Okay, this is endothelial malignancy. Then talking about the HPV. What is this HPV? HPV stands for? HPV stands for what? Yes, guys. HPV stands for? Can anyone tell? Yes, human papilloma virus. Human papilloma virus. Okay. Before proceeding further, I want to tell you a few high yield points about HPV. So look here. This is very, very important. If you see the previous years also, you will be appreciating that they had asked questions about the subtype of HPV. Okay. So HPV 1, 2, 4. What does it cause? HPV 1, 2 and 4 is associated in causing common warts or Veruca vulgaris. Okay, so HPV 1, 2 and 4 is associated with causing common warts or Veruca vulgaris. Then HPV 6 and 11. HPV 6 and 11. This is associated in causing condylometa acuminata. That is also known as the enogenital warts. Now, there is one point here that you should write it down. So guys, when you talk about the condylometa acuminata, that is the enogenital warts, right? Then you also have something known as condylometa lata. What is this condylometa lata? So the names are similar, but they are different, right? So what is condylometa lata? Dark night, exactly. This is uh, seen in syphilis. Can you elaborate this? Condylometa lata is a pathognomic feature of which type of syphilis? Pathognomic feature of secondary syphilis. Okay, secondary syphilis. So you write down a few points here. What is the pathognomic feature of primary syphilis? What is the answer? Pathognomic feature of primary syphilis? Your answer is going to be Shankar. 
शैंकर प्राइमरी सिफिलिस वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट नो एंड सेकेंड क्वेश्चन इज इज दी शैंकर पेनफुल और पेनलेस इज दी शैंकर पेनफुल और पेनलेस बिकॉज यू शुड नो द डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ जेनाइटल अल्सर विच टाइप ऑफ जेनाइटल अल्सर इज पेनफुल विच टाइप ऑफ जेनाइटल अल्सर इज पेनलेस just like i told you about the genital herpes group of cycles painful having red base okay the syphilitic chancre is painless very important it is painless it is not going to cause any pain and it is going to have a clear base the base of this ulcer is going to be clear and this is the pathognomonic feature of primary syphilis okay then similarly pathognomonic feature of tertiary syphilis Pathognomonic feature of tertiary syphilis. What will be the answer? Tertiary syphilis. The answer is going to be gamma. Gamma. Okay. So if you see gamma in the CNS, that is the neuro syphilis. So gamma is in case of tertiary syphilis. Okay. Then you talk about the primary syphilis where you see the chancre, and then secondary syphilis where you see the condylometal lata. Okay, condylometal lata. Moving on to the next point. HPV. Now, if I ask you a question, in which type of HPV you would see the high risk of cervical cancer? This is very very high yield, so highlight this point. what are the high risk subtypes of hpv associated with cervical cancer okay you will see the previous year questions in which they had given option 16 18 okay so that means 16 and 18 but in case they don't give you the option 16 or 18 then which subtype you are going to mark your answer is going to be 31 33 okay so keep these points in mind 16 18 31 33 these are the high risk subtypes associated with cervical cancer okay as well as eno genital or oral cancer or oropharyngeal cancer so guys this is very very important regarding hpv moving on to the next very high yield point about hpv how do you think hpv leads to cancer how do you think hpv is able to cause cancer Can anyone tell how is HPV able to cause cancer? Yes, guys. The answer is HPV expresses two types of onco proteins. HPV expresses two types of onco proteins. Number one is E six. Number two is E seven. So it's a very high yield. Okay. Now, what is the uh, what is the uh, reason how E six and E seven are leading to cancer? So remember the mechanism. E six inhibits the P fifty three. And what is P fifty three? P fifty three is a tumor suppressor gene. So guys, remember tumor suppressor gene as the name itself is telling you. What is it doing? It is suppressing the tumorous growth. It is controlling the growth. Okay, so it is inhibiting the uncontrolled proliferation of cells because that is why it is known as tumor suppressor gene. So uncontrolled proliferation of cells is being inhibited by the tumor suppressor genes. But if you inhibit the tumor suppressor gene, obviously neoplasia or cancer will occur. Now there there will be uncontrolled proliferation of cells. So this is what they are telling. the e6 the onco protein that is ex, uh, that is expressed by the hpv it inhibits p53 and ultimately if tumor suppressor gene is inhibited there occurs uncontrolled proliferation of cells okay then talking about the e7 e7 inhibits something known as rb that is retinoblastoma protein retinoblastoma protein is also a tumor suppressor gene so see if e7 is inhibiting the rb that is tumor suppressor gene again risk of cancer okay so you should know these points coming back moving on to the next oncogenic pathogen h pylori okay helicobacter pylori 
so which type of cancers could it cause number 1 gastric adenocarcinoma number 1 gastric adenocarcinoma number 2 malt lymphoma okay so these are the two types of cancers that could be associated with the h pylori keep this points in mind then how do you think guys h pylori is able to survive the acidic environment of stomach this is a very important point yes how do you think h pylori is able to survive the acidic environment of the stomach anyone your answer to this question is yes gurjeet dark night you give the right answer h uh, the h pylori is urease positive so what will urease do what will urease do anyone what will urease do hmm urease is going to convert the urea into ammonia okay ammonia is formed if ammonia is formed that creates an alkaline environment around the h pylori and this protects the h pylori from the acidic environment in the stomach all right moving on to the next oncogenic microbe that is htlv1 so this is a virus htlv1 this leads to adult t cell leukemia or lymphoma okay now let us discuss three very important points here supposing the question is telling you which parasite which parasite is associated with causing cholangiocarcinoma which parasite causes cholangiocarcinoma yes your answer is clonorchis clonorchis the spellings may be wrong clonorchis sinensis which is also known as liver fluke clonorchis sinensis sinensis which is also known as the liver fluke all right then second question which parasite is associated with bladder carcinoma which parasite is associated with bladder carcinoma what will be the answer yes gurjeet excellent that is the right answer schistosoma hematobium schistosoma hematobium it is the correct answer okay similarly schistosoma hematobium could also lead to hematuria okay the blood in the urine next question which parasite which parasite is associated with megaloblastic anemia which parasite is associated with megaloblastic anemia what is the answer yes anyone which parasite is associated with megaloblastic anemia the answer to this question is diphylobothrium latum diphylobothrium latum okay another question so these are all previous year questions itself which anti diabetic which anti diabetic medication could lead to vitamin b12 deficiency let me see who can answer this this is a previous year question which anti diabetic medication so although obviously it was not being asked this directly okay they will give you the history and then they will integrate here 
Yes, Shashank. Shikha, you gave the right answer. The answer to this question is metformin. Okay. Metformin is the oral hypoglycemic drug that is being given to the diabetics, but it interferes with the absorption of vitamin B12 and hence it, it could lead to vitamin B12 deficiency. Now guys, next question. In case of vitamin B12 deficiency, what will happen to MCV? What would you expect? happening to the MCV increase decrease or normal yes Shashank you gave the right answer MCV is increased okay so this is going to be more than 100 I told you in the previous lecture okay, anemias are basically being divided on the basis of MCV okay MCV less than 80 80 to 100 more than 100 Less than 80, 80 is microcytic. 80 to 100, normocytic. More than 100, macrocytic. Okay. And vitamin B12 deficiency anemia will have what? So this is a megaloblastic anemia. Okay. So what is the pathognomic feature of megaloblastic anemia? What is the pathognomic feature of megaloblastic anemia? Again, very high yield point. Very easy also. Your answer is hypersegmented neutrophils. Hypersegmented neutrophils. Okay, hypersegmented neutrophils means neutrophils having more than five lobes. Okay, this is a pathognomic feature of megaloblastic anemia. Keep this point in mind. Coming back, so we have already discussed these points, uh, let me ask you one more question here. Yes, so now this difference is very very high yield the difference between the iron deficiency anemia and the anemia of chronic disease this is very high yield first of all why they are differentials of each other because in both the cases serum iron will be decreased in both the cases serum iron is decreased both of these are anemias Okay, now let us try to understand the differences. So this is very important. Hematology is very high yield. Okay, so number one, what will happen to the serum ferritin levels in case of iron deficiency anemia? So what are you expecting to happen to the ferritin levels? Anyone? What happens to the ferritin levels in case of iron deficiency anemia? Okay, Shishang and Shrika say the decrease. What is the reason? Why do you think serum ferritin levels are decreased in case of iron deficiency anemia? What is, what is ferritin? What is ferritin? Yes. Yes, the live session will be available later also. So if you are not able to visualize it now, it will be available on YouTube later also. Yes, remember ferritin is the storage form of iron. This is the storage form of iron. So in iron deficiency anemia, the stores are also depleted. So ferritin levels are reduced. But what happens in case of anemia of chronic disease? First of all, you should know something about anemia of chronic disease. Anemia of chronic disease happens in the patients who have chronic infections or chronic 
inflammatory conditions okay so if i ask you okay, what type of anemia happens in the patient who have chronic infections or chronic inflammatory conditions your answer is going to be anemia of chronic disease similarly if i change the statement the type of amyloidosis type of amyloidosis occurring in patients having chronic infection or chronic inflammation what will be the answer what will be the answer the answer to this question will be reactive amyloidosis what is that reactive amyloidosis what is getting accumulated which amyloid protein yes reactive mansi we are talking about reactive anyone chronic infections or chronic inflammatory conditions you see reactive amyloidosis yes gurjeet are you there answer this question exactly a a a a amyloid okay again next question in multiple myeloma what type of amyloid deposition multiple myeloma your answer is going to be al okay in multiple myeloma al coming back now they say that in anemia of chronic disease the serum ferritin levels are increased this is very high yield point rest of the topic i'll teach you tomorrow but this point i'll take before stopping this class why serum ferritin levels are increased in anemia of chronic disease even when serum iron levels are decreased what is the reason guys the question that i'm asking you is ki although serum iron levels are reduced in anemia of chronic disease but still we say that the serum ferritin levels are more why this happens anyone hmm remember ferritin apart from being the storage form of iron ferritin apart from being the storage form of iron this is also what this is also an acute phase reactant yes mansi you gave the right answer this is also an acute phase reactant okay this is very important so acute phase reactants are the substances for example we are talking here about the positive acute phase reactant okay acute phase reactants are of two types so acute phase reactants are the substances that either decrease or increase with the increasing inflammation the positive acute phase reactants increase with increasing inflammation ferritin is one of the positive acute phase reactant so anemia of chronic disease happens in chronic inflammation inflammatory or infectious diseases so more the inflammation more will be the ferritin that is why in anemia of chronic disease the serum ferritin levels are high despite of reduced iron okay so this is very high yield point remember it the rest of the differences between the iron deficiency in anemia and the anemia of chronic disease i will be taking up tomorrow because this is a long topic i will need to make you understand about the transferrin and transferrin saturation also so you can read about it and uh, i'll see you guys tomorrow okay bye bye and drop in your feedbacks whatever improvements you want me to do okay i'll read them